um just don't bother me but i might have to like kind of hold him sometime <laughs> okay we're gonna let people in and um you know don't worry you can keep talking <laughs> you know it's it's not some uh, like before i larissa knows it's just like we would hang out and have pizza so <laughs> yeah. relax yeah so don't no stress <laughs> Um, yeah, and it's really about sharing your work and then thinking about the issues together. And if you have questions yourself, like if you're working on something and um, and connecting and people connecting people, you know. Um, so let's see. Okay, so we're streaming uh -huh. on Facebook, and we're also um, we're also live on Zoom. So welcome everybody. So, but also, you know, people probably pop in a little bit later too because it's. Um, you know, the internet, and it's always hard to find the link <laughs> and get on and whatnot. Um, but I'll just, you know, keep us on track with time because I want to hear all you have to say. Um, so thank you everyone for being here for the Eco Art Salon. And I just wanted to first acknowledge that we're on unceded uh, territory of the um, Lenape Lunape and um, to thank them and their um, ancestors and their future generations. And I also wanted to thank the Paul Robeson Gallery, who has been supporting these salons for, you know, um, two years now, and also the support of the Clement A. Price Institute, which um, is also our sponsor. And um, I wanted to thank also the Eco Art Committee, and um, we can see Colleen is here, she's um, part of it, and so is um, uh, Crystal Robinson, and they're both MA uh, candidates at Rutgers. So um, thank you so much. And, um, and Colleen herself is a curator as well, like a very important new work curator and artist. So, um, and I also wanted to acknowledge the ECHOES group or the Ecology, Culture, History and Open Sound Lab for collaborating on a series of eco art salons with us, um, with artists working in sound. So um, they were very interested in the nocturnal medicine uh, uh, artists um, in, in terms of sound as well. And um, so this, again, it's meant to be informal. We used to be, you know, a group of folks that would come together every month over pizza, you know, um, and, you know, we just talk about work in progress, people's practices, um, you know, questions in terms of issues, um, sharing, as we we're saying, like sharing contact information, sharing ideas, possible collaborations. So it's about building community. So, you know, we're hope hoping people will come back and, um, just start to get to know to people. And um, we do have folks presenting first, um, the, the artists will present, but then we'll kind of close it. And so it won't be recorded and we'll be able to kind of have that feel again of being able to share in a way that's, you know, um, a little less about, you know, performing, but more about, you know, connecting with folks and um, thinking about possibilities together. And, um, uh, so I just wanted to note that we are Facebook streaming right now. So you are being recorded just in case, um, just for the presentation portion. Um, and um, so today our Eco Art Salon is um, Ritual and Grief, Yurishi Mojo and Nocturnal Medicine. And um, these artists all um, work on thinking about grief and healing um, during our eco crisis and really thinking about the individual and the collective as well. Um, this March um, on the 11th actually marked the, uh, the 10th anniversary of the Great East Japan earthquake and um, the tsunami and the nuclear meltdown that happened after that um, in Fukushima. And so um, Yuri's work really reflects upon that. And we're really grateful to have her here and also for you know, her work and um, being able to um, hear about um, her experience um, with her family, who is from uh, Fukushima, and um, in her and yeah. how it shows in her work. Yeah, you can clarify more okay, too. Sure. Yeah. Um, no, feel um, free. <laughs> oh, it's my turn now. Oh no, just feel free if you if okay. you wanted to clarify that because I I want to make sure we have it right. <laughs> so hi, uh, I'm Yuri. My name is Yuri Shimojo, and I'm so grateful being invited for this salon and I'm so excited to learn more about our nocturnal guys I'm so um you know just just so yeah thank you for having this opportunity Alex I have um 
as you introduced me, I have this body of work, five paintings, large circle paintings, uh, watercolor paintings about life cycle. And the title is the uh, title of this body of work is called Mem Memento Mori. And right now, uh, it's showing at uh, Prey Shadows Art Gallery in uh, Boston until April 18th. And so if you guys are around Boston, please go and see the actual work. So these uh, five paintings, actually, I have painted right after tsunami, earthquake, and uh, this uh, 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 radiation um, happened in Japan 2011 and um, I just gonna skip really quick um, because I, I want to talk about uh, the environment nature and the healing but um, I was going through my personal issue that time and I was just when it happened I was just uh, devastated um, as Alex said, um, my family is from Fukushima. Actually, my I was born and raised in Tokyo, but my father's side ancestors are roots in uh, Fukushima, the area. Uh, but it's generations, generations back when they were samurai, and um, the it's called Aizu clan, and they are the sort of last samurai uh, before Japan uh, uh, modernized 18, 1860s and um, no 1886 something like that sorry my history is not good um, so anyway uh, but I grew up in very unique uh, family background um, the very eccentric parents and I had a, a mentally disabled sister and so my childhood was in Tokyo in the 70s was very colorful in many ways and before I become 30 uh, they have they they actually died I mean all of them passed away so I lost my immediate family um, by 30 years old so um long story short when the fukushima thing happened i thought i lost everything uh my life my family is already gone and i thought my country and it was because of yes the earthquake tsunami those were the natural calamity but uh the third one uh, uh a nu nuclear issue that was man that, that was co caused my human hu human being and it was the uh dynamic of this whole uh tragedy was so um impact and the, the huge impact and i didn't know how to digest that time but then um i was walking uh brooklyn my neighborhood uh uh, Williamsburg at that time and I saw cherry blossom I, actually exactly the season right now that I was walking and then I saw the cherry blossom was falling the sidewalk and I just heard the news from Japan that cherry tree started blossoming among the debris in the most affected area and it just encouraged me and moved me and I just was so inspired by how nature is so uh it's it's very um fierce but also how um the resilience and the power of the rebirth so i started to paint uh those uh, petals because when i saw the uh f the uh, cherry blossom petals were falling uh the sidewalk in brooklyn instantly just a sort of sensitivity towards some of my emotional 
attach an emotional connection to that little petal very uh, brought me back to get very close to Japan, which is very, I mean, geographically very far away. So um, after that painting, I started to paint four more and all about life cycle. And I think Alex, you have the little two minute slide of yeah. what I was making. So if you could share that, would be great. second yeah it's about it's uh 2011 to 2013 i was painting these five uh watercolor paintings but everything's sorry oh. sorry i i seem to um the, the the videos that i had are um here hold on one second yeah so it's all started like very spontaneously so um those two years, of course, I didn't work every day for the two years, but the... okay, so, sorry, is it, is it the pedal Mori for Duke that you're no, talking about? no, the, uh, the slideshow? Yes. Okay, here, hold on. here it is. All right. Sorry, I just have zoom situation. All right, here we go. And Beautiful. It's a lot, right? <laughs> um, so it's a lot and it's hard to explain about Memento Mori in one minute, but um, it's about life cycle and I can talk about each paintings like maybe, but um, uh, maybe another time. <laughs> And so um, anyway, those paintings were um, shown in 2013 and 2014 in to Kyoto and Tokyo. And this is the first time I show them uh, outside of Japan. 
and and it's just a um coincidentally it's it um the 10th anniversary of um that day march 11th and also we were going to the second year of this covid situation so i really wanted to dedicate uh not just this tsunami the anniversary and um but also this collective uh, d uh disaster that right now we're going through and um especially the last um of the slide show that you saw this uh, little paper the those are uh, petals and i made them from the uh the washi paper which again it um just found accidentally when i was at at uh, preparing my uh, paper to work and i put them into uh, a petri dishes individually and i placed on the salt bed um 108 and what i'm trying to say is i really want to focus on the life of individuals um when you hear surreal number of the uh death toll like five hundred thousand dollars and you have no you you get numb so i really wanted to focus on each life i mean i wanted us to have the opportunity to think about think of each individuals and 108 is the very mystic number of um sacred mystic number and if you google 108 you will amaze so it's not just the buddhism or any uh religion but more like some larger context of the mystery of the earth i can say so 108 is uh uh sort of in buddhism we were told we have 108 emotions so also we could say 108 egos and in japan every um new year's eve um every temple uh ring i mean gong the bell huge bell 108 times to um trans to for the transition of the old year to new year to sort of mean meaning of cleansing your you know ego <laughs> of the previous year so anyway um do i have time to show that another to me yeah so this is the installation for my first exper experiment of the uh, uh 3d work uh, co collaborating with the alec fellman and Maria Takeuchi, who did the projection and sound, who might be watching right now.
Thank you. Um, maybe you couldn't really hear the sound, um, but uh, it was 108 minutes long and um, 108 uh, different times the each individual uh, you know is focused and 108 bells um, I, I I mean we can share later the link so that if you are interested more I, I can I like to share more information but uh, so, yeah so that's that's my uh, recent show and as you see, um, I sort of, instead of I painted cherry blossoms, it's more like a reflection of my emotional, um, very, it's abstract. It's very hard to explain by words, but um, I think nature gives us sort of collective sort of universal understanding of like let's say when we watch sunset we all human feel something from i mean i i i want to i i i really want to i, I believe that all human feel something when we watch sunset or dawn or flower or you know, beautiful water or something. And I like to um, translate the sort of collective um, sort of relationship with nature by my work. And yeah. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Yuri. And like, we can talk a little bit more about it. Um, and um, also for when we do the breakout, because um, I think um, it's really interesting how you were saying before also how like the perseverance of nature, especially during quite like the disaster that you saw, right? The cherry trees that influence you so much. I mean, that's really powerful. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Yuri. So we're gonna um, engage now with nocturnal medicine and then we'll come back and we'll um, talk some more. So um, uh, nocturnal medicine is, um, a, a, uh, uh, is a nonprofit design studio co-founded by uh, Larissa Belchich and um, uh, Michelle Chauffet. And they're dedicated to taking on the larger than life challenges of today's environment. Um, they use experience um, design to create connection empower communities and forge cultural transformation. Um, so Michelle is a designer, musician, and educator. And um, uh, she also um, is very impressive in, in, in thinking about um, uh, the emotions in design and um, uh, also, um, also her, her capabilities in working on um, uh, um, com com compositions, because I wanted to um, kind of underline that, especially with um, the, the piece that we had talked about before. And then also um, Elegy for Insects. And then um, also uh, for uh, uh, Larissa, um, she has been a, um, uh, a designer, educator, and community services provider, uh, but she also um, is of working on climate re resilience and adaptation and landscape architectural design and thinking about right the environments in which we experience right um uh, climate environment but also like thinking about these um experiential um uh, projects that um, they work on which is very interesting so i think the pairing is is just very interesting so um welcome and um, i look forward to hearing more about your work Thank you so much, um, Alex, for inviting us to, to come share about our work at the Eco Art Salon. And Yuri, thank you so much. It was amazing to hear about your work. I'm, I'm so excited to talk to you about it some more. Um, so uh, Larissa and I have um, a short presentation with some um, a little bit of background behind the thinking behind nocturnal medicine. And then we'll get into some juicier slides of just like pictures um, and 
some stories about um, how ritual and grief and spatial design have played out in some of our projects. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. And can everybody see? Okay, great. So, um, uh, Alex already mentioned this, that, you know, we're, we're a nonprofit design studio and we're focused on, um, yeah, the, the, the environmental challenges of our day that are larger than life and so difficult to grasp. Things like climate change and extinction, which, you know, we read about and we hear about and we actually feel the effects of, um, but it's really, really hard to, to have, um, to, to process these things. And so our mission is to create a cultural shift in our relationship to the environment. Um, and in terms of where our studio sits and where our work sits, we're kind of in, in the middle of the realms of creative, the creative world, arts and design, the environmental world, and the spiritual world. So um, all of our work has this spiritual component, this, and that's often where ritual comes in as a way of bringing people into these larger than life, really challenging topics. Um, and yeah, we wanted this, this little Venn diagram of nature and culture. Um, this is a good illustration of like where our work kind of stems from. So, so we know that climate change is an environmental damage emerge from cultural dynamics that, you know, govern how we live with nature. So Climate change isn't the only issue we focus on, but it is a central theme because so many of the other environmental issues we focus on stem from climate change. So yeah, we should we, should, we illustrate this because um, so much of the emphasis today is on technological solutions. What kinds of solar energy or green energy do we need to focus on? What are the ways that we need to you know, recycle or use more? sustainable materials and of course all of those things are really significant but but climate change is also a cultural issue and that requires cultural transformation yeah if i could just say something about that also i think like where that thinking is coming from is just like an understanding that right climate change is kind of like the result or like the outcome of like a, you know a centuries to like a millennia long ideology of like a certain way of like exploiting and dominating um the kind of non-human world and so our work is very much like um first kind of like motivated by noticing that like that's where these problems are coming from, from that kind of dynamic that really pervades like, you know, American society, like European society. Um, and then trying to come up with like, well, what are the actual techniques and like interventions that can take place to kind of like, you know, un untangle the, the stronghold that that idea of like hierarchy and domination has on us yeah yeah um and this is this is sort of this is the reason why this is a quote um from a fantastic article um about different artistic approaches to um, climate change and the author says that without reflection and mourning people can become inhibited from taking meaningful action and what, what this means to us is that in, in many cultures, we don't have the spaces or the practices for acknowledging and processing and digesting the changes and the losses and the degradation that we're facing all the time. And so we sort of, we get hit with the news cycle about, you know, the wildfires or, um, the tsunamis and it, it, it piles up, but we don't really have um, an, uh, an infrastructure for really looking at and dealing with those things. And so that's what Larissa and I 
um, really seek to do in our work. Um, and this is sort of a this is sort of a loose um, explanation of of how our work creates an impact. So our approach is instead of using um, really didactic materials or like hard facts to try to convince people or change their minds or or try to get them to care, we use experiential education we use really sensual sensory environments we almost seduce people in a way into coming into these issues that we typically don't want to approach because it's so uncomfortable it's so um disturbing so we use these methods to bring people in and and in doing that we help people create intimacy and connection on an emotional, personal level with these issues, which are so hard to grasp. And the, the, the mission, the goal is that, you know, as we continue doing this and we continue building spaces in our communities for people to have these kinds of connections, we can foster a more resilient culture and ultimately accelerate the sort of cultural and social change that we need in order to fully address these issues. So, Larissa, do you want to talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, I will. Um, so, there's kind of like I think two elements that are like maybe at the, the core of how we work, which is like the creation of space and the creation of ritual. Um, so like in the projects that we're going to look at, you'll kind of see how like these two things are sort of like working together. Um, in terms of the creation of space, I mean, it's kind of like speaking to what Michelle was saying, which is just that like, there's literally a kind of like spatial poverty of like places to go to come together and like process and understand and like go through an emotional response to something like extinction. Like an example that we often give is just like, for example, like when, you know, someone that you love, like a family member of yours dies, like, you know, I mean, every culture that I know of, like has some kind of like funeral, um, both ritual and also like actual spaces that exist in order to like, and there, those things are called on when someone dies and you kind of like, they're used to guide you through that process of like understanding death. But when it comes to something, you know, like, you know, mass extinction of species, like we don't have a place that we go to, to think about that together, to feel about that together. And that kind of like prevents us from even doing it at all. We're like stuck in our own homes, doing it by ourselves, which is really insane because it's happening on a planetary level. You know, it's like the ultimate collective experience. Um, you know, and so, yeah, so we're, we're very focused on kind of like, what kind of literal spaces do we need to make? What do they look like? How do they feel? Like, where are they? Um, and then, of course, like, ritual is, is really important as well, kind of like, well, thinking through, like, what happens in these places? I mean, rituals are kind of like these symbolic scripts, right, that we reenact, um, in order to make meaning out of something or to understand something um, and kind of like doing it over and over again helps us do that. And so we do use a lot of ritual that we kind of like create in our work. But I think one of the kind of differences in say our work versus like the way ritual works in like a kind of more like standardized religious practice um, is that because we are creating things that, you know, they don't necessarily exist. Um, people don't have an existing kind of spiritual relationship or ritualized relationship with these issues. Um, it, you can't really like overly prescribe um, something that's going to be meaningful to them because they need to kind of like be able to authentically interact or authentically experience. Um, and so you'll see in our work, we don't really like, um, it's not really performative work. We're not really like asking people to like adopt a character or to do a ritual that we think that they should find meaning in. Um, what we tend to do is kind of like create these platforms or these sort of like 
scripts and like different prompts that suggest to people a kind of mentality of sacredness, um, but allow them to kind of be the actor themselves and to kind of like figure out what's going to be meaningful for them. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a little bit about like how the work works and like how, you know, these things are kind of playing out. And so we'll look at some projects now and, and kind of see how that goes. Yeah, so, um, so Elegy for Insects, um, kind of tied to what Larissa was just saying about extinction was an event, um, an immersive experience that we created um, to, to basically, you know, create one of these spaces, invite people in and to say, we're going to collectively reflect on this issue of mass insect population loss. Um, and, you know, we have, we had basically um, a series of different um, entry points that kind of invited people in. And one of them was the central altarpiece that was in the middle of the room. So um, this altarpiece had on it all sorts of fruits and honeys and nectars and um, delicacies um, that come from uh, basically that are uh, pollinated by insects. And, you know, there was honey and, and kind of this mess of like gooey, fresh yeah. fruit um, that people were invited to, you know, come and taste and interact with and touch and smell. Yeah. <laughs> and in the middle of the altarpiece, you can see right here, this was a marble slab and heaped on top of it was a, a mound of dead bees. Um, that was kind of shrouded with this black veil. And, and so this was kind of the way that we communicated to people and, and welcomed them into this issue that yes, we're here to, to be with our, be in community and to have this collective experience, but, but the focus of our time together is going to be on, on this. And so throughout the night, you had people coming in um, touching, tasting fruit, looking at the table, and then their eye would be drawn to this, this heap of bees. And that's where the questions would start coming up for them. You know, that's, that was the, the um, sort of visual cue for people that, oh, I need, th this is what we're focusing on. Yeah. And I can I just say something about that. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, like kind of from that dichotomy right of like the juiciness and abundance of like the fruits and all of these things that like we get from insects like the dichotomy of seeing that with um these kind of bodies and like the sobriety of, of that um and i think like that prompts like that's that lays the ground right for a sort of like um ritualistic or like spiritual engagement like with these materials were like the way, once you kind of see these two things together, the way that you now engage with the fruit, whether you eat it, whatever you're doing, like it becomes imbued um, with this relationship and, and with these kind of feelings. Yeah. And that's just like there for you to use now. Yeah. And also, and, and aesthetically that, you know, a lot of the materials we use, the candles, the flowers, um, the fruits, a lot of these things in different cultures are used in funerary contexts. And so they kind of, um, they, they cue to people, um, they signal to people, hey, maybe there's something ritualistic going on here, but we're not gonna tell you exactly what it is or where it comes from or how you need to interact with it. That's up to you. Um, and actually, Larissa, as you were as you were talking, I remembered that at the event there was somebody who, you know, after seeing the pile of bees, was was felt very moved to eat one. Like he wanted to dip it in honey and and eat one of the bees. I'm not sure why, but this is just an example of you know how different people will react to the prompts that we that we give them. So so this was sort of like a 
a more visual um, way into the to the theme, but um, there was also a, a sound bath that we composed um, where kind of at the height of the party, we asked everybody to lie down on the ground and we had designed this, um, this sound experience where we had five different speakers throughout the room and each one um, very, very quietly at first was playing, you know, a cricket sound. And then there was a cicada coming from that side. Um, and then there were some other, you know, sounds coming from different parts of the room. And the spe each speaker was being held by someone. And so the, the, and they were slowly moving around the room. So the sound was kind of traveling closer and farther away from people's ears. Um, and you know, while this was happening, Larissa and I were, uh, we were walking around and we had flowers in our hands and um, we were, you know, we had asked everyone beforehand, if you're okay with touch, keep your palms open. And if you don't want touch, turn your palms around. And part of this um, experience was using, using flowers, using the flowers to kind of create this, um, tactile form of connection between you know what we're what we're exploring and the audience so these are these photos are are really intense just to see all these people lying on the floor but you know it, it, it was very it was very powerful and there was a kind of emotional arc to the sound bath. So it started very, very quiet and gentle. And then over time it intensified and there was a singing bowl that we played on top of it, um, you know, which puts people in a very deep meditative trance. And then we slowly brought it back down until there was just one cricket left in the room. And then that very quietly faded out. And what, what happened after this is we had, um, we had a DJ who played um, a song that we had selected to kind of, you know, bring, wake people up and slowly gently bring them out of this state. Um, but it was a song that was kind of heavy and moody and intense, but also had a beat so people could start moving and dancing. And this was a, a major turning point of the event yeah. where people, um, people just, you know, through dance, which is another thing that we um, hold space for at our events, um, could kind of like work through this emotionally intense experience that they had just had collectively. Yeah. I kind of want to tell the story about the story I like to tell about the dance. Oh yeah, tell, tell, tell. <laughs> I love that story. There was um so yeah, as Michelle was saying at, at this event, kind of like the sound bath like really did kind of pour the whole room into this other emotional space, and you could really feel it. Like it had this very like thick and like serious heavy texture. Um. And as Michelle was saying, kind of like after that, this like pretty intense and like very focused dance party like emerged from that feeling. I think of people like just needing to work that out together and like come together and, and be with each other, move together. So that was kind of going on. Um, and like at one point during that, I saw like all of these people kind of like gathered underneath this like light installation that was hanging from the ceiling and they're all like looking up at it like oh my god pointing and I'm like what you know what are they doing um so I go over to look and I look up and there's like this little moth that's like fluttering around um this light and everybody was just like looking at it with so much like awe and like reverence and it was just such a beautiful moment um because it really like people you know people were regarding this creature as if they'd never seen one before they'd never seen a, a moth before um so i just feel like to me that really spoke to like the kind of power that was created by like you know the the sound bath and by that whole thing that it really I do feel that there was a kind of like emergence of a new um a new conception of insects or a new realization of, of this of what was going on um yeah 
Oh, and this is one other anecdote from another iteration of the event. We did another version of Elegy for Insects in Los Angeles um, at um, a horticulture shop. And uh, there was a very similar installation as the one we just showed you, but uh, with the bees on the on the slab. And um, what was interesting was that at the end of the event, there was, you know, a smaller group of people who had remained and um, it was very intimate and people were kind of reflecting and talking. And, you know, I started kind of taking things down to deinstall and um, a couple people came up and asked, well, what are we going to do with these bees now? Like, what are you going to do with them? And um, a few of them suggested, actually, the, the owner of the of this horticulture shop suggested that we bury them um, at, at the on the grounds in the garden. And so um, it wasn't planned. It was just totally spontaneous, but there was a, a group of people who came together to dig this hole and kind of like pour the bee bodies into the hole and cover it up. And now they're, you know, a part of this, um, this space. And, you know, it's just another um, way in which these, the, the prompts that we set up can, can inspire people to um, create a ritual that that makes it that creates meaning for themselves. So this was another event. Um, this was called the Rave for Ecological Grief. Um, we put this on uh, in partnership with MIT's architecture school. And um, what you're seeing now is an image of like the entry hall. So you've just walked in. And before you enter the party space, there was a pedestal here with um, a stack of um, pamphlets that we had made. And, and this is what the, this is a, a segment of what the pamphlet said. On the left side, there was a kind of meditation that you could read um, that kind of slowly brings you into the space. And then on the right side, there's this kind of um, essay prose um, that um, brought together um, like a few different anecdotes that tied to this to the ecological issues we wanted to focus on one of them being waste production and so this was just a, a small detail that invited people to um, reflect and kind of primed them before entering the party space. Um, and, you know, there were, similar to Elegy, there were installations throughout the space, but this one, we want to just focus on this one, which was um, a kind of altarpiece that we had created in the center of the space. And essentially what we did was we, we removed all of the waste bins and recycling bins from the space. We, we, there was no trash cans anywhere. And our, our intention for this was to create a kind of slab and, and to um, you know, adorn it with candlelight and these bowls of um, like rose water and flower. I think these are cherry blossoms on the altar and to uh, implicitly invite people to place their waste, any waste that they generated throughout the night onto this altar piece. Yeah, and just a comment on that. I think when we were planning this event, this, this move kind of emerged from this idea of like, well, um, if you're making an event that's like about eco grief, like does your event need to be like 100% sustainable or like zero waste or something? Um, and I think we, I mean, we decided no, and we decided to kind of use like the typical way that you would do a, just a party at a school where there's like plastic cups of wine and there's beer bottles. We decided to just kind of use those typical standard practices to actually like be the cues that bring people like into consideration um, of waste production and how kind of like it just shows up all the time in, in your life. Um, 
And again, like, yeah, we didn't like tell them to put their trash here. We just, again, we kind of did it through just taking away all the trash cans, but still giving them things that they were going to need to throw away. Um, and just sort of like the slow realization of everybody. And like this, this altar was kind of like in the middle of a dance floor. Um, so it kind of wound up being a sort of centerpiece of like people gathering around it. Michelle, you can maybe- Yeah, yeah. And it, it was just really fascinating to see that over the course of the party, people's relationship to this altar went from one of total confusion. Like at first people were like, wait, what's going on? Why is there trash in the middle of the party? This is really weird to, you know, people who, who people would come up and kind of tend to it throughout the night. People would come and take care of it and neaten it up and stack things up and uh, really kind of put their, give, give it their attention and care. Um, and again, this event was sort of anchored by music and dancing that um, we, you know, we, we always collaborate with our DJs to um, kind of flesh out the emotional tone and the emotional narrative and arc of the party. Um, and, and then they, the DJs will kind of curate the sound to move people through that experience. And so this is just a moment um, from that. Um, so this last project that we'll tell you about, um, is called Divine Seepage. And if anybody's familiar with Los Angeles, then you may be familiar with this oil field. This is called the Inglewood oil field, and it's, um, the largest remaining piece of contiguous open space in LA. And, um, it's, it's an active oil field. And um, the purpose of, of this project, Divine Seepage, was essentially to take this, to, to take the um, oil industry of Los Angeles, which is something that is um, kind of hidden and buried away. You can see that th this land is completely inaccessible. This is a highway that cuts through it, but all around it, you're completely, it's completely fenced in and, um, oil extraction extends far beyond you know the boundaries of this of this land it's all throughout the city but the city has like much of the world has a relationship to it of kind of shame and denial like we don't want to look at this we know we're dependent on it but we know it's bad for the environment and so we can't we we don't want to look at it we're more comfortable existing in this space of denial and so the purpose of this project was to create a series of interventions in the oil field that would invite people to, to kind of create more intimate and, and almost pleasurable experiences um, with the infrastructure and the systems taking place on the oil field. So this was one example where um, all, over the, all over the oil field, there are these pits that are dug up and they dump the toxic sludge in the pits. And the, the problem with that is that you have these sort of toxic water pits um, that birds kind of come into and they swim into and they try to eat in other wildlife and it, and it kills them because it's quite toxic. But on the other hand, there are some species of algae and other aquatic plants that thrive in this environment. And so the, the idea behind this little vignette was that, okay, what if we take these, you know, chemical filled sludge pools and we encase them in a kind of greenhouse and we celebrate the fact that there is a form of vegetation that is so resilient, it's, it's thriving in this context of chemical waste. And what if we uh, what if we invited people to take boat rides on this pool? So you can see there are little boats here, um, and the idea was just to how can we bring people closer to this and help them um, face these um, aspects of our reality instead of turning their backs to them. And this was another example that. Um, 
that basically proposed a nude beach in front of um, a renovated oil tank. Um, so one of the other issues that is common in the, um, in the oil field is that um, the, the cylindrical tanks that you typically see um, that hold the oil, um, wild birds love to roost on top of them because it's just a flat space that's easy for them to build their nests on. But um, the Fish and Wildlife Department has mandated that whenever that happens, you have to kind of halt um, the use of, of those um, oil drums. And so in this you know, speculative proposal, the idea was, okay, what if, what if we created a pyramidal oil tank with the spike on top so no birds could come and roost on top but um, and what if we actually invited people to come in closer and had this had this beach this nude beach that people could come in and kind of in the rawest form of themselves encounter these these materials and systems and, and um, infrastructures that we are dependent on and the, re the reason for the nude beach, just to give context so it doesn't sound completely random, is that just adjacent to this portion of the oil field, there, it, there's a sort of outdoor um, gym that people frequent. And so this was sort of an extension of that. But if I could just close that out, right? I think that this project, like, it's a good example of, I think, also just the role of, like, pleasure and seduction. Um, in the work and how like because these issues are really difficult for people to handle we're often like again like Michelle was saying trying to seduce them in and to like make it somehow enticing to, to be close to these things um, like erotic even yeah 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 so that's <laughs> that's it guys um, that's that's a little bit about nocturnal medicine. Um, if you're interested in learning more, this is our website and our email and our Instagram, and um, we would love to hear from you. So thank you again, um, Alex, for inviting us. And I'm, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Great, um, I'm gonna put us all back to together. Thank you so much. It was really great to see all these um, different projects that you do. Um, and uh, you really can see the thread of um, what you're trying to build in these um, spaces as well. Um, and um, hopefully we can talk more about that. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions before we kind of go into our, um, hopefully we'll actually delve pretty quickly into our, our small space in which we're actually not recording anymore. But I did want to ask, um, because um, you really were talking about ritual and setting a space for ritual and how important it was. I think it was so interesting how uh, Michelle and Larissa, how you were inviting people to create their own ritual, right? Um, through these prompts. And then um, Yuri, I, I wonder if you might also talk about ritual in the way that your, you, you, your process uh, exists, right? Um, because it's also kind of like thinking about the individual's uh, creation of ritual, right? Um, and um, I wonder also with Michelle and Larissa, if you might um, comment a little bit about like the process of you creating this space and like, you know, and, and your discussions together and like, why did you come together to actually create this space? Yeah. Um, I don't know if Yuri, you wanted to start and then maybe we could um, have uh, Michelle and Larissa um, comment after. Sure. Well, uh, I really enjoyed your presentation, uh, Larissa and Michelle, because it's so many points that I sort of made that's it this is this is really I really I'm talking about it's the so before that um yes uh ritual I mean my work uh or I even say my life I can say it's all about rituals I grew up with rituals. My family was so into everything, not, nothing but rituals. And so my work uh, is so connected with uh, rituals. And actually, um, so I have lived in the middle of, no, not middle of nowhere, it's a really remote Hawaiian community in Maui 
for many years. Uh, I used to do back and forth between uh, the jungle and another jungle, which is Brooklyn. Oh, Alex, you can show the picture. That's so. That's the evidence. I I was that was I was I used to live in the flower farm of uh, uh, rainforest, and so and this. The reason I lived, uh, this is what, when was that? I think it's like a 2010 or something. And okay, that's okay. You can skip the picture. <laughs> and um, so there are many reasons that I lived there, but one very important reason was, so after my family, all my family passed away, um beside i had to accept my destiny my life my fate i mean it's just surreal to uh lose all immediate family that it's not like a your your i mean it's not war or anything but just they uh left this realm one by one since i was uh 13 and so one you know after they are gone when you want to talk something with your mom or father or like the family meeting everybody is the other side so i had i sort of got used to the only way to communicate with them is i have to kind of break the boundaries between this side and the other side i'm talking about this side is this our uh, reality that we're facing the crisis of earth and the other side is after you know we all die the spiritual realm and when i talk about spiritual i am not talking about uh, uh, religion and i think that's something in common i got the sense here and so i very interested in uh, the existence of invisible things which is of course include uh spirituality but also include emotion too so when i saw your work like i really love the idea of seducing to something that you don't want to see i i i really i mean the cherry blossom work or other my those five paintings i have used that sort of idea too something that make people to pay attention wow what is this it's so detailed or wow it's beautiful color or something and then uh give them the opportunity to think what it is and my sort of um present i mean same as you guys it's huge like you said it's the theme is huge like life or na nature or so there are so many fragments that you can you um the people connect and that's totally up to them. And I do agree with your way of approach. So that's why I'm very uh, sort of, how do you say, uh, honor the abstraction of my work. I try not to eliminate even the title of the work. I just make it really simple. And I, I saw one, piece of you guys you said something up you put some algae the in the bath and yeah the second is it second that the, the, the blue painting is titled is allergy too oh yeah I know it's interesting and mm -hmm. and that's about uh indicates a uh, river river we call it river sandu it's about the life in between death and life so but it's not about limbo it's not about it's good or bad it's just that there is a area there there is a space in between and 
there are many. I mean, I, I think uh, River Styx is the, uh, um, also they say river. So it's something related to water. And I, I learned many uh, culture, they have the after death world is related to water. And I think it's very interesting. So, um, and I really like the idea of, you said, uh, elegy and the sentiment, but sort of like a very, how do you say, uh, romantic too. Mm. And uh, very old, very old school <laughs> and romantic and very uh, universal, this sort of um, sentiment. And I really love that. And I really love the way you did um, sort of accelerate the, uh, you know, the, how they, how they connect. And so anyway, um, I was going to say the rituals, I have very connected to animism. Uh, if I pick some, not religion, but the way of seeing the spirituality. And uh, that's why I lived in this uh, indigenous community in Hawaii and so many connection to my own Japanese background. Um, it's sort of Shintoism, but also before Shintoism and this so I was very interested in this uh, indigenous uh, spirituality through my sort of understanding of where my families are. It's not about psychic or it's not about, oh, you see the ghost? No, that's not what I'm talking about. It's more like a, uh, the just a very fundamental human sense to connect with the other side, also with the nature. So I felt very uh, common idea with what you guys doing. Great. I don't know if Michelle and Larissa, if you wanted to uh, mention anything um, further about um, thinking about working together on um, these projects specifically, how it came about that you might have um, begun actually even to do this. Yeah. Um, before we answer that, I just want to speak slightly to what Yuri just did, um, or just to kind of like offer back um, some mutual appreciation. I think one of the things that I found very beautiful about your work, and that's just like so important, I think, um, like, you know, we talk about, like, we're not prescribing rituals for people and they need to come up with them on their own and I think that's very true but in the same sense like I, th I think your work is so incredible because I, I see you doing a lot of that like for yourself like devising like the practice the material practice um the kind of temporal practice that's going to help you yourself kind of like connect with or talk to um or move through you know um, a, a brushing, a brushing against these kind of like spirits that that you're talking about. Um, so I just I wanted to kind of share that that appreciation um, and an acknowledgement of, of what you're doing. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Can I say one thing? That I because I mean now I I, I want to share about some one very important lesson that I got from Auntie in in uh, Hawaii. So she is not, I mean, she's like, a, let's say nobody, auntie. And then, um, you know, she's not like a shaman or kahuna, but she is. And she's a, um, a herbalist. And she teaches people uh, how you make medicine from the Hawaiian plants. And she teaches us how uh, ancient Hawaiian people did uh, used to do the practice. And what I really what inspired is when you go to the woods and when you uh, forage, when you harvest those medicine, 
Uh, you can just take them and make medicine, but that's just the application. And she said, all the process is so important. So you bring this, uh, this thing called ho'okupu, which is, uh, which is about uh, offering. Actually, do you see this plant right here? I sparkled from Hawaii, the like, little, uh, the stem, but this is, they, they, um, uh, they use just, this, this, it's called tea leaf and TI, and they um, say this is the highest frequency of their indigenous plant. So they use this for like when they have a headache, they place around here. And so when you uh, harvest medicine, the, the, the uh, sacred plants, they place, they put some salt or like a rock or something that they share the appreciation, wrap with this tea leaf and place where the, for the, uh, God and then uh, the, the ancestors were. So I really um, inspired those process that they do care about. Um, so I um, uh, use those same idea to my work that I grind ink and make ink uh, the, with the semi ink and the especially uh, that one uh, the cherry blossom piece the center gray area is actually people think it's a background but i, I painted after i painted those petals as sort of paint gray wrapping i mean sort of like a wrap around the petals as a meaning of sort of uh honor I mean, it's like a, the seawater, like tsunami uh, came and wrapped around the body, the people who had to ascend their uh, life with the loved one behind. So all these sort of meanings are in the painting with my, I was grinding the semi ink, which my mother used so that I could connect with her actually physically through the ink stick. So I can talk on, on and on and on, but so that it's everything about the uh, ritual because of the process is so important. Beautiful. I don't know, Michelle, did you want to say anything or? Yeah, I would, I would say that um, just in terms of how Larissa and I tend to approach our work, we come at things from an extremely intuitive and emotional place. And we also, you know, and it, our, our, Larissa and I met in graduate school for landscape architecture, and we already had, we, we, in the projects that we were doing there together, um, we were bringing this kind of intuitive, emotional, lens to everything we were doing and what we quickly discovered is that that it's that's not a point of view that's um like really accepted or uh celebrated in design like we were really um discouraged from approaching things um from this emotional lens and so uh when we started our practice together um it was very obvious that those were going to be like the guideposts for how we approach our work. But I would say another influence for us comes from our respective cultural backgrounds. So um, my background is um, Iranian Jewish and um, Larissa comes from a cat Italian and Croatian Catholic back upbringing. And so, well, a lot of what informs the rituals um, or the ritual-esque things that we embed in our projects comes from the rituals that each of us um, grew up performing, you know? Mm -hmm. So one example would be that in, a, in an Iranian funeral, when someone dies, you pour 
rose water and mint leaves into their grave. You wanna send them with these sweet smelling things. And um, so in the altar that you saw with the trash, there were bowls of rose water to kind of allude to, to that and um, things like that. Yeah. yeah, or even just I think the, the practice that we use like in both like in the elegy and in the trash altar, like the practice of having the kind of dead body on display and in the room is like one that like I was introduced to as a child, you know, like attending um wakes and, and yeah, like a wake, you know, kind of before the funeral and you just sort of like hang out in the room. Um uh, yeah, with I, the, um, yeah, with the visible body of, of the person who passed away. Um, I think the other thing I would just say about like the way that Michelle and I work, I think our work, I mean, it requires, I think, both of us to have like our own kind of individual relationships and like journeys with these like issues and the sort of like processing and feelings about them and to like, I think each of us kind of engage either in our kind of like individual art practices or life practices like with kind of um, these issues and use ritual in different ways. And I, I think that that's really necessary because like when it's time to like do one of these kind of events, like Michelle and I, like they're not really for us and we sort of have to be acting as a sort of like facilitator or someone who's guiding, who's kind of outside of it and is grounding everybody else and is being sort of steady so that other people are like free to kind of be light or difficult or like not want to participate, whatever it is that they're feeling. Um, so I think we do a lot of work kind of like outside of our projects to kind of become capable of guiding other people um, through that stuff. Uh, I have a question to you guys. <laughs> I, um, so you know, I re so okay. I can't wait to experience your um those you know those not. I mean, but so this since this pandemic, I mean lockdown and all that. How do you how do you do? <laughs> I mean, how do you do? It's funny, but how do you practice? And what's how it's also evolved and how it's evolved and what are you exciting to do in the near future when it's all when we are all the other side of the rainbow that's a hard question i think that's been really painful for us mm, i bet um, yeah like we haven't really gotten to practice that much i think with other people and I feel I don't know maybe I don't want to speak for both of us but I, I do feel like we've been sort of more focused on our own experiences of what's been happening and just like what are the kinds of practices that like I need to do or Michelle needs to do in order to like move through and like keep processing and I, I feel like I don't know it feels only like now that we're sort of starting to be able to like be that kind of like guy or like Mm. for other people um, i don't know if you think the same yeah no I, I i completely agree um there was a moment in the early pandemic where you know digital events and zoom events just were um the thing and and we we both had the same reaction we didn't want to to participate or to to create space in that way and we both honestly just needed to take a lot of time to heal and recover from the from the effects of it um yeah. but one thing i'll say about like the other side of the rainbow is that i think this like collective experience of loss mm -hmm. and grief of the pandemic has kind of um brought people into a more receptive um mm -hmm. state i think for the kind of work that yuri is doing and that we're doing because people mm -hmm. are really hungry for um opportunities to like make sense of or reflect on um these these losses and this grief yes and i think it's so important to give the opportunity to i mean it's sort of arrogant to say to give opportunity but 
make the environment that we all can share like yeah right right so because i so people get so i mean so i i having actually you know that the physical show in boston right now and you know like six people can go to the gallery uh without any uh reason i mean um make an appointment but it's so great to see people see actual you know painting right here physically and me seeing them getting emotional like that sort of i want to just hug them but i don't but that kind of so when i saw your those uh practices like oh my god that that's like it looks like a like a dream like a past life dream that people are laying down and the smell and actual physical experiences so but i think it's so important i mean it's so not interesting the how you guys going the next after this experience collective experience because as you said people are like so thirsty to what you guys been doing yeah so we should collaborate is what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> like a yoga and it's to I mean, i'm so thank you alex this is like a perfect curation committee yeah thanks Kelvin and crystal was yeah. here but um yeah, yeah. <laughs> i can't wait i mean i just when i was uh you know watching your um uh, those uh histories i was like wow what can i do with this and i already thought about how can i join and how like oh. it's so incredible and yeah it, it's interesting that uh did you think about the one of it's one of many 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 elements that sort of hitting us but for example so people get COVID, they lose the sense of smell. Mm. And mm. I thought it's very direct message from the what nature or me, our human is part of the nature, the sort of idea. It's sort of direct coming to your face. Hey, you human, you're also part of the nature, and now you don't have the sense of smell. Right. What do you think about it? Like, <laughs> interesting. Here, I'm gonna um, pause for a second because um, I want to be able to bring in everyone, kind of. Um, um, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I, normally, like I would have turned off the Facebook, but it was just so interesting. <laughs> so I'm gonna um, turn off our um, Facebook. So five folks who are on Facebook. Next time, join our Zoom. <laughs> but um, glad that you could be here. We, we're just going to um, uh, allow for more um, conversation with um, everyone in the Zoom room. So we're just 